Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Okay, welcome. Welcome to today's webinar, everyone. My name is Sarah Carr. I'm Chief Knowledge Broker at Octo. Um, and I'd really like to welcome all of you here today, as well as our presenters. Today, we have Sam Brody, who's Director of the Institute for a Disaster Resilient Texas at Texas A&M University at Galveston. We have Carlos Martin, who is a Rubenstein Fellow at the Brookings Institution Metropolitan Policy Program, as well as Director for the Remodeling Futures Program at the Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies. And we have Carolyn Kowski, who's Executive Director of the Wharton Risk Center at the University of Pennsylvania. So we'd like to welcome them all today. We're gonna get, go ahead and hear from them in just a minute, but I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. Um, we're gonna have the first part of the presentation, the, the, or the webinar devoted to the presentations from the, the three speakers. And then we'll go, move to a Q&A period. You can send in uh, questions through the question panel in the user interface or through the chat. Um, and then you can also use the chat to um, present views or other information that is relevant to the topic. We just ask that you be respectful in using the chat because it can go out to all participants. You can choose whether it just comes to us as uh, panelists and organizers or to all attendees. And we just ask that you use it respectfully and keep it to the topic at hand. Um, so thank you. Thank you guys for being here, Sam, Carlos, and Carolyn. Sam, I'll turn it over to you to start. Thank you for having me. I'm gonna present briefly uh, a framework for coastal risk reduction, which originally uh, came out of the work we did for the governor of Texas after Hurricane Harvey in 2017, uh, which to date is, was the biggest urban flood event in US history. Uh, and the challenge was given to me to uh, come up with a, a comprehensive framework for flood risk reduction that can be explained in 30 seconds or less, and that would provide guidance for decision makers at the state level. And it kind of evolved from there and became um, a, good, a good benchmark or a good foundation for this book uh, and a good way to uh, frame flood risk, not around a single strategy or even a set of strategies, but more of a comprehensive program. So in 30 seconds or less, uh, what is flood risk reduction? What is the framework? There are four components. Um, the first is to avoid, that's getting out of the way. The second is to accommodate, that's letting it flood, which is not in our American bones. Uh, the third is to resist, stand and fight, and that's the, most of our tradition in the United States of dealing with flood risk, particularly in coastal areas. And then the fourth, and I think uh, most underemphasized but most important uh, component is to communicate, tell the story of risk. Uh, a little more detail, Avoidance can be a vertical proposition. So this is a, uh, a school built after uh, Hurricane Ike on Galveston Island in 2008. Um, it can be for an individual residence. This is a home that was raised, an existing home raised at least nine feet after Hurricane Harvey in Houston in 2017. Um, but we need to be careful about how high we go and what's feasible, what's, what uh, is equitable um, and accessible. Uh, this is back on Bolivar Peninsula, uh, where a one-room um, a one-room uh, cabin was elevated. That's at least twelve feet high. Um, but avoidance can also be a, a horizontal uh, endeavor, and so it's pulling back away from these critical areas uh, like uh, riparian areas, and that's where you start to get multiple values: recreation, ecological values home values around these open space areas tend to shoot up uh, when they're well-maintained. Um, on a coastal environment, you might guess that um, the homes to the north directly on the beach uh, fare differently than the, the homes built uh, by the same developer in the same set of years that are protected by a beachfront and some wetland areas. The same storm, you can imagine, the homes that were set back 
that were avoiding the immediate wave action fared much better and do so over the long term, plus you're picking up ecological value. Accommodate is designating areas that we want to flood. We do that with retention and retention ponds and reservoirs, but it could be extended uh, to strategic areas where we want to stay out of and encourage flooding for multiple values. And that can be a small pond that people can picnic out of their office space uh, that has ecological value, but also serves for stormwater retention or something that's more ambitious. This is an actual park, a linear park by day, a holding area by storm. I think that's in Texas. Uh, but really the gold standard for both of avoiding uh, and accommodating flood is, is this, protecting freshwater wetlands. I can't emphasize enough <clears throat> how much research has been done to show that protecting freshwater wetlands, both big and small, um, not just reduce flooding, but flood impacts, particularly in coastal regions um, uh, in the United States. Third, resistance. Um, we're really good at that. Uh, we continue to pursue that as a strategy. Uh, this is Attucks Reservoir in Houston, uh, right before Hurricane Harvey, where it was almost breached and uh, they had to do a controlled release and that flooded another 10,000 homes out of the 200,000 in that storm. I actually went there last weekend. Uh, they, the big improvements were, they, they just made a bigger spillway. They shorted up. Um, I think it's really important that if we're gonna resist, uh, we maintain, we monitor, and we plan for the life uh, time of that structure. Uh, in my world, most of the time, people don't want big superstructures, structural solutions that hold back water. Um, they want this, dune protection, uh, but this is actually a uh, extremely large levee built in the Netherlands where they uh, combine dune restoration with recreation and a beach and they're standing on the, the dike. It's a solid core dike. So we don't need to have these superstructures necessarily uh, impacting in the environment. And it's hard to communicate that to folks in the United States because we end up with a New Orleans resistance measure which worked pretty well in Ida recently, but it's single value, that's a 35, foot high concrete wall. Um, finally, communication um, in my, well, I have four minutes left. Um, I, you know, I think that if we really want to deal with this um, coastal issue, changing environmental climate conditions, rapid development, we need to do better at communicating. And that goes for me as well as a, as a professor scientist, communicating the results in a way that are uh, understandable, actionable, interpretable, and lead to action and outcomes. Um, one of the biggest problems in large metro areas, case in point, Houston, where I live, is that uh, lo lo local residents don't understand that the street drains don't work if they're clogged with uh, debris. And this is, uh, in my opinion, the most vulnerable street in one of the most vulnerable cities in the country that had flooded four times in four years, and this is after that flood, um, understanding that responsibility, communicating the importance of that is not a very expensive or time-consuming endeavor. This is not the time to sweep out the drains. This is not the time to communicate um, the, the risk of your home. This is again in Houston after Hurricane Harvey. Um, not flooding is a huge value booster at the time in Houston. Imagine that. If you didn't flood, that, that, that is a selling point in a home. Being from the East Coast, that was a foreign concept. Well, that's not a great time to, or, or method to communicate. Uh, we're looking at other, here's other examples. This is our buyersbeware.com platform uh, where it's kind of like Zillow meets risk, particularly around floods where um, during a real estate transaction process where flood risk really needs to be communicated and disclosed um, you have these tools that um, you put an address and you get um, a very simplified um, color coded risk score, but it's based on the best data models coming out of the top research universities and environments in the world. 
Um, it's this platform we're going to expand and improve uh, for flooding and fires in Texas as a segue to communicating risk in ways that people, it resonates with people and also provides um, uh, guidance on what individuals can do to reduce their risk because that's not the only reason uh, someone will or will buy a home. Um, and here you get into these structural elevation, avoidance, uh, different types of activities and provide guidance on what an individual can do, but also the decision makers are craving better communication. This is a million points of loss from Hurricane Harvey. Um, how do you make sense of that as a decision maker and convert that into something that's more meaningful, more accessible, web friendly, and, and is a better segue uh, from data to visualization, to communicating that visualization, to learning and outcomes. Um, the most important thing I can say in my remaining minute is that there is not one silver bullet um, in a flood risk framework for coastal areas. Um, it's really a, um, the portfolio of different strategies, they're synergistic. Uh, that, that recipe, that portfolio is up to a local community um, and it depends on what's best for that community uh, and understanding the contextual characteristics, the environmental, physical characteristics, the socioeconomic characteristics, the cultural characteristics, and the built environment characteristics. So, so it's impossible to say, hey, this is, the, this is the recipe for you. Localities, regions need to figure out what's best for them, but having the tools in place and understanding what works in other situations and what doesn't and applying that to their community, I think is the best way to go. So that's the end of my talk. You can um, go to our website, Fairly New Institute, uh, and get more information, see some of these web tools. Uh, and I'm also always available by email um, if anyone has any follow-up questions. Thank you. Carlos, you got it. Okay. All right. Sorry, I didn't know if there was going to be a break in between. <laughs> so, <laughs> hi everybody. This is Carlos Martin. Um, again, from uh, Brookings Institution and Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies. And um, I'm actually going to be fairly brief in my point, mainly because I want to talk about updates to the chapter um, in which we're um, going to be, uh, I'll be referring to. Um, so I'm assuming the slides are up and somebody can give me a thumbs up to let me know that that's the they case. They are. Yep. Thank you. All right. So the, the focus of my work was how do we pay for all of the various portfolio that Sam um, just mentioned? Um, and what, how we paid for these things in the past and how we can pay for them in the future. And if you'll see in the book um, that um, Carolyn will talk a bit more about, there was a, there was a wide um, speculation about alternative ways, public-private partnerships, private investments, et cetera. And I um, stood on the line of using traditional public financing. Um, so my two big points in the chapter were really around ensuring that one, that we expand public funding. So I'll, let's distinguish funding, which is actually providing direct funding uh, and investments um, and financing the alternatives that um, jurisdictions can use to um, pay for it and pay that money back. So on the funding side, my argument was we, can, we just need to expand current public funding. Um, what we had was insufficient. We needed much more money, particularly on the federal share. Um, and knowing that the federal government was gonna be on the hook or a uh, majority of the relief response and recovery that happens when we don't have the defensive infrastructure that's in place. The second point was that the current financing structure that we've used in the United States for the past half century to, um, seven, to 75 years has been working just fine, um, that it really depends on the government in question's capacity to borrow and less on what they're actually using it for. So you could pay for a variety of the portfolio components that Sam is mentioning, provided that whoever is taking the money out or being financed is able to pay that money back. So we don't necessarily need anything that's particularly innovative. We just need to be pushing more of the same um, financing and funding mechanisms and expanding them to a broader group, right? So um, what I wanted to do today was give a little more of an update than the charts that we have on the table. Um, 
The somewhat bad news is that there is still generally a big difference in who is paying for um, uh, in the capital investment, capital infrastructure in the United States. And that is state and local governments are vastly uh, outpacing um, the federal government in terms of these um, investments, even though we often hear more about, particularly as of the last few months, more about the federal role in infrastructure, particularly uh, um, um, uh, the, the gaps that are the, compared to the gaps that exist in the infrastructure world. So the federal share is still pretty modest compared to the state and local. So the federal share on the chart that you're seeing is the orange line, the state and local is the blue. In the post uh, bond finance world with the, of the, um, uh, that started out after the post after war era, um, that has just expanded massively. So the good news is there has been a little bit of an uptick. I don't know if you can see from the 2018 low that was in the book, that was in the chapter, there's a little uptick that goes up in 2020. What explains this? Tellingly enough, um, it's the public safety. It's the exact infrastructure that we're talking about, that Sam has been talking about, the levels of infrastructure that are going um, 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 from the federal government to state and local government. So most of that uptick on the federal side, even though it was very slight, is almost all on public safety measures, which include much of that adaptation. So in absolute numbers, we're talking um, overall funding going from 5.4 billion to 11.7 billion in total federal public investment. Um, that's a big change. So some of that is from the recent efforts uh, from HUD's Community Development Block Grant Mitigation Program for expansion of Army Corps uh, funding um, to uh, continuing FEMA work. FEMA's BRIC announcements, of course, just came out this year, so they wouldn't be tallied in this, um, in this number that you see in front of you. But it's still, it's a, it's a significant change for the federal government to be investing that much more in these areas. Uh, but again, we know the reason, the purpose of the federal government's investment is to save money on the downstream, right? From not having to pay for the relief response and recovery that occurs when infra, this kind of infrastructure fails. So I think this is a perfect conversation to have right now. Um, for the same reason that I hinted at before. Uh, if the infrastructure bill is on the table, that doesn't look like the infrastructure bill is gonna make, um, to alter that much. That includes a massive expansion, billion dollars going to FEMA's Building Resilient Infrastructure Communities Program, an additional three and a half billion going to the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program and Flood Mitigation Assistance Program. So almost $5 billion, billion being allocated to the specific defense, coastal defenses, as well as other kinds of hazard defenses that we've been talking about. That also includes, um, that, so that's what people typically look at as the coastal defense. That infrastructure bill also includes $8.7 billion going to transportation related um, improvements that are uh, related to coastal adaptation. Uh, $11.6 billion to Army Corps for additional flood control and river dredging, and then a, a slew of other smaller program uh, funding streams like going to NOAA to help do predictive flooding, et cetera. So <clears throat> the important point here um, regarding this transition that's occurring right in front of us is that there's still a piece of the pie in the reconciliation bill that nobody knows what it's gonna end up looking like that we're still in having grappling with, right? One is how does the um, how does uh, infrastructure at the housing level, so excuse me, adaptation at the housing level, get funded, um, knowing that housing is not considered part of the bigger infrastructure bill. But also, how are we talking about the equity concerns associated with who benefits from these investments? The major executive order um, that came out in January has resulted in the Justice 40 requirement. That is, that 40 percent of the benefits. Um, uh, go to uh, disadvantaged communities uh, for specific programs. Pilot programs include FEMA's BRIC program that have to be inc included in the in Justice 40 um, allocations. So there are a lot of questions that are unresolved, um, but in the at least in the finance world, we're moving to a better allocation uh, based on the need of particular for coastal adaptation. Um, we're looking in terms of the federal government's investment in coastal adaptation. We're looking at expansion of 
traditional finance and the bond markets with a lot of increasing numbers of jurisdictions, including Houston, the Houston examples um, that um, Sam mentioned that have used um, the traditional public finance bond mechanisms to um, fund a lot of the new investments that are occurring in, uh, in our state and some localities. Um, the only argument um, that we need to add to that is that they're using the global model of the Global Adaptation Fund's Climate Readiness Program is that we also have to be considerate of those jurisdictions, those states, and those municipalities and stormwater districts that simply don't have finance capacity that aren't bond ready um, for a variety of reasons, including the fact that they may not have enough tax revenue. Um, so those places need to have special targeted assistance, both to prepare them for bigger bond financing, as well as in many cases to simply invest directly with direct federal public funding to provide um, the same kinds of protections for those communities as um, those that can't afford to finance them. And that's my story. Thank you, Carlos. All right, and we'll hear from Carolyn and then we'll, we'll take questions on all the uh, presentations. Okay, that sounds great. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, does that, can everyone, can you see my slides okay? Yes, we can. Great. Um, okay, hi everyone. Uh, it's great to be here with you virtually today. I'm going to first talk a little bit about my chapter in the book, which was on insurance and coastal adaptation. And then I'll just um, end by giving you a quick overview uh, of, the, of the book project as well. So the, let me start from the beginning about why do we care about insurance? Insurance is really critical for recovery from climate related disasters. There's now a robust body of research that shows that those with insurance recover better and recover faster than those without insurance. And that's largely because there's often no true substitute for having the necessary resources to recover. And we could unpack that more in Q&A, but most Americans don't have enough savings to cover you know, the thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars that they could face after a severe climate related disaster. Lots of folks are locked out of access to credit or loans. Federal disaster aid is much more limited and takes much longer to get to people than is commonly assumed. So for these reasons, insurance plays this really important role in, in having resources in order for people to get back on their feet and have a safe place to live again. Yet as disaster risk is escalating because of climate change, so as it's escalating, that's making insurance even more important because we're facing more of these disasters and more severe disasters. And so we need insurance even more to provide this financial resilience. And yet those same forces are also stressing insurance markets and threatening in some cases, the very insurability of these risks at the time we need that financial protection the most. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the current state of disaster insurance for house. I'm gonna focus on households at the coast and what changes are starting to occur in those markets and what we might do about it. And so we'll be focusing primarily on coastal disasters, things like flooding and hurricanes. And so I wanna start by mentioning there's essentially three types of insurance for those types of coastal risks, your homeowner's policy, wind pools and the federal flood program. So let's go through each of those in turn. So the most widespread insurance is your standard homeowner's policy or standard property policy, 95% of homeowners have one of these standard policies in place. And as much as people might want to have a hurricane policy, if you're living on the coast exposed to hurricane risk, that doesn't exist in the U.S. market. So your homeowner's policy will cover the wind damage from a hurricane, but it doesn't cover the water damage. So it's not very intuitive for homeowners who want the particular disaster, which they think of as a hurricane, to be comprehensively covered by their insurance. The other challenge with having standard homeowners insurance as your only protection at the coast is that most policies in some of the highest risk areas, so all along the Gulf Coast, throughout Florida, up the Southeast, policies tend to have what's referred to as a hurricane deductible, which means if the damage to your home is from a named storm, you actually have to sh shoulder a much higher share of the losses than if it was from any other cause. And so typically hurricane deductibles are from like one to 5%. We've seen them as high as 10%, which means that 
and this can sometimes comes as a shock to people when they're trying to recover from a hurricane, that maybe they have a standard $500,000 deductible. That's not the case if the damage is from a hurricane. Then you might be shouldering, say, 5% of the total damage. So there's a lot of limitations in people's homeowners coverage. The second thing I want to mention are these state wind pools. And I want to back up by noting sort of why we have these and what role they play. And the fact is that disasters are much harder and more expensive to insure than non-disasters, non-disaster lines, something like auto accidents, for example. And the problem is that for disasters, insurance have to insure access to enough capital that a severe disaster event doesn't bankrupt them, right? And that's expensive. <laughs> There's a number of things. There's, you know, they can take reinsurance, they can put risk into the financial markets, they hold their own sources of capital, and all of those things make the disaster insurance cost more than a non-disaster line. But that's also explains some of the limitations on coverage you see, things like the hurricane deductible. It's an attempt to help make that risk more insurable for the private sector. But sometimes it gets really extreme and you see a breakdown in insurance markets where consumers can't find policies at all at a price that they can afford. The disaster risk essentially is so high that any insurance policy costs more than people are willing or able to pay for the coverage. And in response to that type of dynamic, almost every state that's prone to hurricanes has set up what's referred to as a residual market, which is essentially a quasi to fully public insurance program to provide wind coverage for those who can't find affordable or any homeowner's insurance at all. Most of these were typically created after a particular hurricane event showcased problems in the voluntary market, either in terms of availability or affordability. And what we see is that in the places with the highest coastal risk right now, so let's look at Florida, right? These state um, programs, which in Florida is Florida Citizens, you see the, the little logo up there, has become really huge. And over the last you know, decade, it has um, gone back and forth between being the largest and the second largest insurer in the state. And so it's really holding a lot of the wind risk now um, as opposed to the private market. And so many commentators have noted, right, that's a shift from these being what they were designed to be, which is markets of last resort to markets of first resort. So we have homeowners policies, then we have these government wind pools to step in to fill in when we see problems with homeowners policies. And as we mentioned, neither of these cover water damage from flooding. So the storm surge damage or coastal tidal flooding or rainfall, you know, any flood risk. So for flooding, we look at the federal program. And the federal program was really created for the same reason the state wind pools were. There was a breakdown in the private market for flood coverage. But quite some time ago, we saw private insurers pulling out of this market because of the catastrophe potential, because of the possibility of adverse selection. And so flood coverage has been provided federally for over five decades. There is a small um, emerging private market we can talk about if anyone's interested, but in general, about 95% of residential flood is through the National Flood Insurance Program. So you have to have this extra policy if you want to cover the, the, the storm surge part of hurricanes or any other flood risk. Take-up rates for flood insurance in high-risk areas tend to be low on average around the country, but are much higher in coastal areas. So this map shows you the take-up rate in the FEMA mapped, what they consider the higher risk areas, which is the 100-year floodplain, the 1% annual chance floodplain, they call it the special flood hazard area. And what you're just seeing is numerators, number of residential policies in the NFIP, denominators, number of residential structures. On average nationwide, about 30% of residential structures in the special flood hazard area have a flood policy. But as you can see, the darker area sort of along the southeast coast, on the coast, take-up rates are much, much higher. And we see that the program has indeed really become quite a bit of a coastal program, with most of the policies actually concentrated in areas um, of coastal flood risk. So these are the kind of uh, three uh, types of programs that are really covering coastal risk right now. And what I want to turn to now is thinking about what's happening with climate change, right? And we know that we're going to start to see areas where risk starts to become uninsurable. So not all risks can be transferred or insured. Um, economists have what they call their sort of ideal criteria of insurability, and disasters are already more difficult to insure than non-catastrophic risks, as I mentioned to mentioned. But as climate continues to escalate, we're going to see this uh, become even more problematic. So, you know, when coastal flooding, for example, is happening many, many times a month in a community, you can just heuristically kind of understand that that's 
becoming more of a certainty, right? And you can't ensure certainties. And so then we're squarely in the realm of risk reduction. Those are areas where we need to go back to kind of the framework Sam had presented and think about what we do to actually start to lower the risks. Um, and we're, we've seen signs of stress in insurance markets before, and these can provide some lessons to what we might be seeing coming down the road with climate change, where essentially prices start to escalate, supply drops as private insurers pull out of the market. If we look at Florida again, most of the major homeowners insurance companies have already left the state. They've already determined it's too risky to be doing business there, or they've so they've completely left, or they've um, dramatically reduced their policy count, or they've walled off a subsidiary to write policies there so that if there's the next big hurricane to hit Florida is not gonna impact the rest of the company financially. And this is again, where we've seen the state insurer taking such a large role. And so what this, and we already see a federal role for flood. So what I wanna stress here is that as we start to see these challenges with insurability, what it really means is that we're gonna face some tough public policy questions in the coming years, because we're sort of out of the realm of the market and really into public policy choices about these programs. You know, what are we going to do with pricing in these programs? Are we going to allow them to reflect the risk as it starts to grow? Are we going to cross subsidize the cost? And if so, in what ways? Are we going to consider sort of radically different ways of intervening in these markets and providing insurance? And it's important, I think, to mention that the way we've been handling disaster insurance is not the only way to do it. And if you look around the world, other countries have taken very different approaches to providing comprehensive disaster coverage to their residents that we could think about in the US as well. So to wrap up, what can we think about doing to help preserve insurability at the coast? I wanted to put forward kind of four ideas from the chapter. Um, the first is to think about any discounts that we're providing to pricing to be means tested in some way. Right now, none of the programs that I've talked about provide assistance with the cost of insurance to those who need it the most, to those who really need the financial protection of insurance because they don't have savings, they're locked out of credit, right? So for them, insurance matters the most, and yet they're the least able to afford it. There is right now, Carlos was mentioning some of the legislation in Congress, there is right now a proposal that would set up a means tested disaster insurance program for flood insurance, um, and it hasn't yet passed, but FEMA, um, the National Academy of Sciences, RAND, lots of scholars have weighed in that this would be um, a very productive reform for the program. The second thing is can we better link insurance with climate adaptation goals? And there's a couple of ways to do this both pre and post disaster. For example, can we re-envision um, policies that pay out a little bit more at the time of a loss so that when we rebuild, we can rebuild stronger and better and maybe in the extreme elsewhere, right? Um, Ex ante, some of these public programs, like these wind pools, North Carolina is an example, have been adopting mitigation grant programs that they actually find to be quite cost effective, where they actually just pay pre disaster for the mitigation to fortify a home ahead of time. The third thing is to talk about these new models, and I talked about new public policy type models to insurance, but there's also a bunch of innovation going on in the private sector. Um, and one thing that might come out of climate is this push for the private sector to really innovate on risk transfer. And this is an area that I spend a lot of time thinking about. And there's new approaches to insurance, things like parametric policies, micro insurance to help bring insurance to those who've been locked out of the market, what's called meso insurance models, where you have something like an NGO or a recovery group or a city in the middle and using insurance as a way to finance assistance. Um, we're working with New York City on a model like this now to help provide assistance to low-income households after a flood. Um, and then, of course, if you look into the insure tech space, there's a whole bunch of exciting things happening to harness new data and technology. So I think there's a lot of potential here, but we need to be doing a much better job of harnessing these new approaches for the public good and for actually meeting our sort of public climate adaptation goals. And then the very last thing to say is that Insurance works best when it's in this broader culture of risk management, right? And when it's working alongside the programs Carlos talked about and that Sam talked about, right? And that when you have all these things working together, that's when I think you can have the most impact. So that wraps up what I was gonna say about insurance. And I don't wanna spend much time here except to say, what you've heard from the three of us are all chapters from this book, A Blueprint for Coastal Adaptation. And if it was interesting, there's nine other chapters covering different topics um, in the book. So I urge you to check it out. I, you know, I, I'm biased, but I think it's a really kind of unique collaboration between a design school and a business school to really bring a bunch of dis disciplinary perspectives to bear on the really difficult question 
of adaptation. And we tried really hard throughout the book to focus on the sort of messy on the ground work of actually getting adaptation done, because I think it's fair to say all of us contributing to the book realize you know, that that's our future now and risks are continuing to rise and we're gonna need to become much more proactive in their management. And so that's it for now. Thank you all so much. I will stop sharing my screen so we can all chat. Okay, thank you all. I kind of wish we each had an hour for each of you so I could really <laughs> dig into each topic. Um, I appreciate all the presentations and I just wanted to remind people, you can ask questions by sending them into the question panel, typing them into the question panel or you can include them in the chat um, and I'll, I'll see them there as well. Um, a question that came in early, but I think you all have um, perspectives on this. Uh, and it's my question too. Uh, it's for, what do you think of FEMA's proposed national flood insurance program rate updates as a way to disincentivize coastal development or maybe incentivize managed retreat at some points and communicate risk to potential property buyers? I can jump in with a little bit of background on risk rating 2.0 and then I'm sure both Carlos and Sam have some thoughts on this as well. Let me just give a little bit of background for listeners. So. FEMA has not updated the way it prices flood insurance in over five decades. And the way they've been historically doing it is just very out of date. So I think the most important thing to realize about this rating change is that it's really a modernization and an attempt to bring rating practice into today's world with our better data and our better models and our better understanding of flood risk that really just did not exist at the time the program was created. So that's kind of the important first piece of it. What that does, though, is helps create better prices to reflect risk at a property level. So it used to be that the program priced risk based on these broad flood zones. And so there was a lot of cross subsidy between low and high risk within those zones because they were they were pretty coarse and not very good at differentiating risk. And so that's all um, going to be updated now. So your price will be a better signal of the actual risk that you face. So if you face a high price, that means you probably are at high risk. It's also going to be adding in rainfall related flooding, which was not previously included in pricing. And that might be a little bit of a shock to some people because you might start realizing there's areas of high cost of flood insurance, even if you're far away from a river or the coast, because you're in an area that of kind of lower elevation that could sustain flooding from rainfall. And we're actually with climate change seeing a lot of increase in intense precipitation events and as a risk that's sort of really growing. And then the last piece, you can see I can really go on and on about the NFIV, but the last piece I wanted to mention was kind of an equity component of it, which is that currently in pricing, there's a sort of very regressive cross subsidy between low valued homes and high valued homes. And low valued homes are paying too much and high valued homes are paying too little. And a private company would never do that. They always adjust for the value of the home and the share of your um, value that's insured. And NFIP is going to finally be undoing that. So to the extent that you think lower income people are in lower valued homes and vice versa, it was very regressive pricing. I didn't say anything about what I think that's going to do to incentives to, to live at the coast. I'll kick that over to Sam and Carlos, but that was an overview of what's happening at least. Yeah, and Carolyn's absolutely right. It's, it's really bringing uh, risk, more modern day measures of risk into the pricing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a stance here just for the sake of discussion, but um, I don't think that's going to make a difference in terms of... Uh, retreating from the coast, relocating. Uh, I don't think, and, and I don't, I haven't seen every single policy. Um, I don't think that the, cha the shift is gonna be high enough to really dissuade people and companies from living and being on the coast. I think we need more fundamental shifts um, um, that require not just updating existing mechanisms, but really rethink the way we're living with water. I'd say the only thing, do I have 10? Oh, just, and one more, the other thing is that realize that the, the pricing schemes rely on really good data. And there are parts of the country where they really don't, you know, the data isn't there to support these nuances and I don't, again, I haven't, it hasn't, haven't seen the outcomes yet, but um, the nuances are gonna be more apparent in areas in larger populated areas where there is better data 
better historic data. And I, and I think that's, people don't realize that. So I'll stop talking and turn it over to Carlos. Uh, the only thing I would add to this conversation is that there are some unintended um, inequity issues that are associated with the changes, right? Because there are low-income households who will be paying more in their um, NFIP insurance, regardless of whether they live in uh, a higher priced um, house or a lower priced house. In many cases, particularly in the last 20 years, we've seen low-income people living in Homes who houses that whose equity whose value have skyrocketed because of justification processes because they're in coastal communities that are high amenity. Um, so the, so there will be unintended um, equity issues. So the idea of doing this means tested um, assistance program is that much more critical. My concern, of course, is that that's not in place at the same time as <laughs> the reservation is being employed, and so which is always a recipe for disaster. So unfortunately, there are, haven't been enough uh, media coverage around those, those individuals, those lower income individuals and those more vulnerable communities. Um, instead, we've seen the stories about wealthier uh, family uh, households moving to the coast. And I just wanna echo my, that. Yeah, <laughs> keep yeah. going, Carlos. No, I, I'm just gonna go on my little soapbox about the, the depiction of families that are wealthy and being shocked by the extra $50 they're gonna have to pay. Um, which um, if for a low-income household it could be devastating. And then not to mention, if you are a low-income household living in a higher um, valued, now higher valued house, um, your opportunities to sell that to a, higher, um, to a higher income household are lower because of the higher interest rates too. So there's just like an interesting equity um, uh, uh, map that hasn't been drawn out by our decision makers yet. I think that's a really important point. And I just want to underline how important I agree that it is that we adopt this means tested assistance at the same time that risk rating 2.0 is rolling out, which would be like right now, because for all the reasons Carlos mentioned, this new rating system is not an affordability program. It is not going to be helping those most in need. And so we really need to couple it with that. The other thing it does not do is address any, and this is coming back to that question of incentives for where we're building and putting people, it doesn't address changing climate risks, right? Because insurance is only pricing this year and it should only price this year. It's only for this year. It wouldn't make sense if you were pricing insurance now for risks that are gonna materialize in three decades. But when we're thinking about where we live, where we move our families, where we allow construction, where we put infrastructure, we need to be thinking about the risks in three decades and six decades and so on from now. And it's not providing any signal on that at all. And insurance can't provide a signal on that at all. So we have to go back to our more standard regulatory tools um, for that. To add to that very quickly, I think I, I, this is a point that both Sam and Carolyn brought up that I didn't talk about. This, this the connection between community or region level wide infrastructure that protects communities and the individual households that are within them. And they're, they're, we're, the systems are set up that they don't even speak to each other, right? So the federal investments in an infrastructure, in a seawall or some kind of defensive structure isn't necessarily well, I mean, now it's getting better with the risk rating 2.0 in terms of individual housing risk, but there's still a huge disconnects between the financial systems that allow certain places to exist and certain not. So the federal government ends up being on the hook for post-disaster um, costs, right? But we're still letting state and local governments say, oh yeah, we're gonna develop over here. We're gonna allow this whole area to continue to be developed and not um, deal with them on their own. So I would advocate that. I would say, I would partially agree with Sam is that I actually think in some cases there's not gonna be an immediate change in many places. I think it's gonna be very place-based depending on like local access to resources, local political power to be able to demand federal government at regional adaptation, so people can pretend to keep living in whatever um, false scenario they've created, created um, because they're only thinking about flooding, not about heat, about all the other potential climate effects that will be uh, affecting their household. Um, but I, 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 it's just a, it's a longer term concern that these systems aren't interconnected. And that's a great point. That really resonates with me. Um, we need we need to think multi-scale from homeowner up to jurisdiction and we need to think regionally and if we don't look at those connections we're gonna i think we're gonna come up with the wrong answers 
easily said, easier said than done. <laughs> right. I would argue, I mean, that's a problem challenge with the federal government right now. And it's, it's that um, constitutional authorities is that they can offer incentives to state and local governments to do better about the land development and land uses, right? Um, they've got to cross that line and start doing sticks and start saying, you're not gonna get your disaster money unless you make some mitigation strategies. I really like the, the CRS type of program, community rating system, where it is, the incentives are a little misaligned, but there are incentives there to do things like acquire properties, plan, think watershed based. It's all there. And I just, I'm surprised FEMA wouldn't CRSify the entire United States in some way that's, that's productive. Um, it, may, it may further break the insurance pool by doing it, but the, the pieces are there um, to build on. And, I, and I've done a lot of work on CRS, so I'm, you know, it's kind of my banner. And I just noticed like the discussion around that program has tailed off and I don't see it really like melding with 2.0 and, and other initiatives, which I think is a shame. Okay, thank you guys. And uh, I'm glad you had this discussion because actually quite a few of the questions we got were about risk rate or 2.0, there were quite a few. Um, another question, uh, sort of comment, comment too, that came up. Um, in addition to the insurance changes, FEMA is looking to end development and flood damage repair, as I understand it, in all flood risk zones. As I understand it, this has already happened in Washington state and will move to other states shortly. As my region is significant significant agriculture and industry in these zones, it's not feasible as presented. Do you know anything about finding a reasonable solution for folks that live and work in coastal areas not affected by hurricanes, but far more rare events like tsunamis? So I'm not sure about, I don't know if Samar Carlos knows about FEMA changing. What might be being referenced here is that FEMA has just requested input on revisiting the standards that communities have to adopt to join the NFIP. So the NFIP is actually a voluntary program. Communities have to opt in. And in order to participate, you have to adopt minimum floodplain management regulations in the 100-year floodplain. And there's been a lot of concern that these regulations are now really inadequate because they're not forward looking for increases in future flood risk. And so that they could be sort of failing to provide enough incentive or enough risk reduction given escalating climate risk. And so FEMA has now put out something in the registrar asking for input on this. I, as far as I know, they haven't actually changed any of it. And I don't know what might be happening in Washington state, but I do know that they're considering this now. I don't know if either of you have other. I, I, don't, I don't know any more than you do. Yeah. Okay. I should say they're actually asking for input on a whole range of things. Um, they're about a whole bunch of things about the NFIP and equity and climate more broadly within the program. So I think they're um, investigating a number of possible changes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, guys. Um, another question that came in is, how I work with marinas here in the Great Lakes through the Clean Marinas Program and have a hard time convincing um, them, I guess, homeowners to implement infiltration practices to help manage flooding on site when they would rather just slope their property to run off, to, to allow the water to run off into the lake, Lake Erie here in Ohio. This only adds to the quantity of runoff and flooding issues for the community. Any suggestions on how to convince them? Oh my goodness, is that Sarah Norman Orlando asking that question? Indeed. She says, hi, Dr. Brody. <laughs> oh, I really miss you. Please come get back in touch. <laughs> she was a former superstar student um, and now a star at Sea Grant. Um, you know, that's an age old question. How do you convince homeowners to do something that um, seems a little harder and maybe more expensive? If I were you, I would look attack those two issues um you know is it is it potentially easier to use infiltration practices are there benefits beyond aesthetic benefits other benefits um rather than just grading the slope um looking at the financials looking at the benefits showing it visualizing it working with individuals um, would be my uh, suggestion. When you put dollar 
signs on things, people listen. Um, and I don't know what you'll come out with, but um, that's a very big motivator, people's pocketbook, but also the amenity value of their property um, and um, kind of the long-term aesthetic benefits of living on water really drives people as well. It's so good to hear from you. Thank you so much for your comment. Again, please feel free to email me later. I would okay. say there are a lot of interesting examples of places that are monetizing the stormwater drain from individual properties. That kind of Philadelphia's case in point, right? It's been one of the leading stormwater management places. So now um, if you're actually producing more stormwater off your property, you have to pay more. So that's one way. <laughs> quite frankly, to, to incentivize. It's less of an education and a voluntary program. And we're quite, quite frankly getting to those points in this country and in the rhetoric that is occurring in this country where we have to start just quantifying and monetizing those costs. And Philly also, besides just basing water fees on like, per, you know, um, runoff from the property, also before COVID at least was providing very substantial financial incentives for these types of green infrastructure investments. So they pay for you to put in part rain guard and um, barrels and all green roofs and stuff like that. Of course, you have to have funding at the local level for those types of incentives, but when you do, I think they're really helpful. I don't know if this is useful either, but of course, there's a lot of behavioral economics research that shows that we like to do what our friends and neighbors are doing. So if you can also get a few people nearby each other, then it tends to cascade out because it's like, oh, this is something all my neighbors are doing, I might do it too. Right. Assuming your neighbors um, do it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And are people you like and want to end <laughs> Right. I think that what we're seeing now, vaccination rates in this country would suggest that there are whole communities that have agreed jointly not to do the right thing. Fair point. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you, guys. Those are some good responses. Um, there was a question. Uh, this is specifically for Carolyn. Is there a risk transference instrument um, already working for mangroves in coastal areas? So there's a couple of things at the intersection of nature-based solutions and insurance to say. Um, one is, is the protection provided by nature-based approaches incorporated into the pricing of our standard property policies? And the answer is sometimes. So like would standard property insurance behind a mangrove cost less because of the storm surge mitigation benefits that the mangrove is providing. And that's sort of actually a more complicated question of getting good quantification of those risk reduction benefits into the catastrophe models that insurance companies are using to price their policies. And those are now also what the NFIP is using to price its policies. And so that's a very live conversation for modelers right now. And um, and sort of methods for quantification. The, the other side of that though is um, some ecosystems themselves can be damaged from the very, you know, these same types of climate extremes. And so I'm not sure if the person asking about this um, maybe is referring to the fact that there's been quite a bit of news attention to, for example, a product that was providing insurance protection to a coral reef off the coast of Mexico as an idea of like insuring nature. And the idea there is that if the reef itself is damaged, it is insured like a property so that there's a payout to go in and restore it. And that type of insurance only works well when you need money to fix something that's broken. And so in the case of the coral reef, it actually works because they pay a whole bunch of scuba divers to get in the water and literally reattach pieces of broken coral. And it actually helps the reef grow back faster and um, minimizes damage. For some systems, and I haven't, I'm not an ecologist, I don't know about mangroves, but some other systems, it's better to just let it regenerate on its own. And then it doesn't really make sense to insure it because there's nothing you're going to do with the money if you're going to let it regenerate on its own. Um, you also, for something like the coral reef example, you have to have a good way to collect this is the kind of classic public goods problem. Mangroves, coral reefs are pro providing goods to everybody who lives on the shore. And so nobody wants to pay for it. They hope other people will pay for it. So you have to have a way to kind of collect, um, you know, this gets back to the benefit stuff, collect uh, assessments from everyone who's benefiting and then pool that together to pay for it. So a bunch of random thoughts on nature and insurance. <laughs> Sam and Carlos, did you have anything to add? None for me. Okay. Um, 
we probably have time for a couple of questions. Carolyn, you had said something about there being a small private flood insurance market emerging. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, in the last few years, there's sort of started to be an interest by the private sector in offering flood insurance in competition with the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, it's growing every year. It's still fairly small, but might be up to 5%, maybe 10% of the market by now. It's hard to know exactly because there's no systematic data collection of the number um, of policies in this market. In places where it's available, it can sometimes provide cheaper or broader coverage than the NFIP. In other places, it can't. In other places, especially very high risk places, private companies don't want to write and aren't going to write at a price. So it varies a lot by specific location. Um, but in most states now, there's at least one, if not more, private flood providers. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a very um, critical philosophical question. Uh, and that's, should people be allowed to rebuild in flood prone areas? Would it be better to relocate them to safer areas? That, that is a age old question. I'm gonna take a stand again. Um, avoidance is the first line of, if, if you're really gonna develop a resilient local program, avoidance has to be the first uh, decision to make. And I think there are so many it depends on the, what you're talking about rebuilding, you know, a hospital versus a home. But from a home perspective, I see so many opportunities to acquire and relocate um, that we're missing um, as a society where it's voluntary that I, I really think that's, we need to work on those future programs. So for example, in uh, Harris County, Houston, surprisingly has like twice as the, the highest rate of flood buyouts in the country by like double the next place. Um, after Hurricane Harvey, there were a list of tens of thousands of homeowners who wanted to be bought out and relocated. Um, but it takes two plus years to go through that process. And during that two plus years, only a fraction of resources you know, is available to, to buy those people out. Um, and I don't like to say buyout, I, I like to say protecting open space or acquiring flood prone mm -hmm. properties. Um, and so all those people um, had to move on, which meant selling to a flipper or walking away. And we're seeing massive amounts of redevelopment on those properties with million dollar plus homes uh, to code now, which is two feet above the 500 year level in Houston, which is the highest freeboard standard in the country that I know of. Um, but we're still putting people in harm's way and we're pricing out um, the non-millionaires. You know, I see it every day driving down this, the road from my neighborhood. Uh, and that really concerns me. Um, I love the idea of, <laughs> So when I was talking about the governor's commission thing and they're like, what do we do? It's like buyouts, like not going to happen. But I was, you know, I'm, I'm going to die on that hill. Um, you know, buyouts, wrong term to use, but I really think um, if there are mechanisms in place, like some revolving fund, so you don't have to wait two years to be bought out. If, you know, all the properties can be ranked, listed, you know, assessed ahead of time and have that, that money be put into play, I think we'll, we'd all be better off in the future. Uh, I had a mentor from Milwaukee who spent his life working on buyouts. And he said, you know, um, you never want to buy someone out. You want to make them whole. And if you articulate that correctly and you provide the mechanisms in a speedy fashion, um, the voluntary nature of the program shouldn't be a problem. There are more people who will want it then um, there are dollars to go around. So, and bias is just one part of this idea of open space protection and regional thinking and, and planning future development. But I feel like there's a lot of opportunity that's being lost around that particular issue of um, protection and relocation around flood risk. Thank you, Sam. Did sure, you want to add about. anything? No, no. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would only just quickly add that um, I think our decision making process about how individual lands are used needs to rely more not just on hazard exposure 
and economic uh, expected economic losses. We have to account for social histories, the value, the cultural values of certain places in America to our national imaginary, to our national story. And I think that's it obviously complicates the story significantly, um, but these are conversations that have long been in the waiting. Okay. Carolyn, did you have anything to add? Oh, well. I'll leave it there. They both okay. had to <laughs> okay. Well, this was good to end on. Thank you guys so much. Um, I'd like to thank both our, both our panelists. This was a great discussion, as well as all the attendees who really, really added to it uh, with um, information about what they're seeing um, with the National Flood Insurance Program's new uh, pricing and, and, and more in the chat. So thank you, everyone, um, for coming today and, and sharing. And we hope to see you again on future webinars. And thank you very much, uh, Sam, Carlos, and Carolyn for doing this. Thank you for having us. Okay. All right, bye. 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 That's right. <laughs>